thanks to MPB for sponsoring this video. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Canon EOS R8, a compact full-frame mirrorless camera aimed at anyone upgrading from the EOS R and RP, or perhaps an older DSLR like the 6D, or maybe an APS-C model. Announced in February 2023 and costing around $1,500 or £1,700 for the body alone, the EOS R8 becomes the most affordable, not to mention the lightest, new model in Canon's full-frame range, positioned below the R6 II and above the RP. This essentially makes it the unofficial successor to the original EOS R. It's also available in a kit with the RF 24-50 launched alongside it for around $1,700 or £1,900. I spent some time with the production ready R8 and in this video I'll show you everything that I've learned so far. I've also made a separate short video about the new RF 24-50 zoom if you're interested. If you're after the TLDR version, the R8 is essentially a cut down version of the R6 Mark II, sharing the same sensor and as far as I can tell, the same photo, video and auto focusing performance. Given that it's £1,000 cheaper than the R6 II at the time I made this video, that sounds like a bit of a bargain, although as you'll learn, there's obviously a number of key differences to achieve that price point. Here's the new R8 on the left with the R6 Mark II on the right, and the first obvious difference between them is the R6 II is a heftier camera, and while the upper controls are actually very similar, they're more recessed on the newer R8. In terms of the features that you can't see here, the R8 loses the IBIS and the 6K RAW output of the R6 II. It has a single card slot, a low resolution viewfinder, no joystick, a slower mechanical burst speed, and a smaller battery too. But again, at roughly two thirds the body price of the R6 II, those are sacrifices you may be willing to make. Let's switch in the EOS RP on the right, still the lowest priced model in the full frame series and sharing a similar recessed control style. The R8 is a few grams lighter, but once they're in your hands, they're pretty much in the same ballpark. Both cameras share a similar cut down feature set, including a single card slot, 2.36 million dot viewfinder, modest battery, and no IBIS or AF joystick either. But while the RP sports 26 megapixels versus 24 on the R8, the newer sensor and processor give the R8 a number of key benefits. Stills photographers will enjoy Canon's best subject recognition to date with a useful auto option as well as a slightly faster mechanical burst speed of 6 frames per second and much faster electronic burst at 40 frames per second, not to mention the raw burst mode with a pre-capture option. And while the R8 lacks the pop-up flash of the RP, it makes up in some part with the updated multifunction shoe. Meanwhile, videographers enjoy a big upgrade on 4K video, which was cropped and lacked decent autofocus on the RP. Now on the R8, they get uncropped 4K up to 60p, full autofocus, the option of C-Log3 and recording times of up to two hours. Oh, and there's also 1080 up to 180p. My final feature comparison is against the EOS R7, costing a few hundred less. The major difference here is full frame on the left versus cropped APS-C on the right, but the smaller sensor of the R7 with its higher resolution of 32 megapixels makes it preferable for cropping in on small distance subjects like wildlife. Conversely, the larger pixels on the R8 make it better in low light or for capturing broader dynamic range, and it also supports uncropped 4K up to 60p. What the R7 saves on sensor size, it invests in higher end body features though, including IBIS, dual card slots, a larger battery, AF joystick, and much faster mechanical bursts of up to 15 frames per second. If you're photographing action or wildlife, I'd say it makes more sense than the R8. Next, I'm gonna delve into the R8's features and quality in practice, but first, a quick word from the sponsor of this video. MPB is the world's largest online platform for used photo and video gear, so when you're ready to buy, sell, or trade, head over to their website at mpb.com. For example, if you're looking for the cheapest full-frame Canon mirrorless camera, MPB was selling the original EOS RP from around £750. Now I'm quoting pounds as I'm from the UK, but they also operate across Europe and the US. Or if you have any older gear that you're not using anymore, why not sell it to fund something new? At the time I made this video, MPB offered me £610 on an old EOS R camera in excellent condition, and their quote also includes free collection. Once they confirm the condition, you can choose to accept the quote and receive the money in your account the very next day. No post office, hidden fees, or disgruntled buyers to deal with. 
I've been using MPB for several years now, so when you have photo gear to buy, sell or trade, I'd recommend checking them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. Right, back to the review. The EOS R8 may be one of Canon's smaller full frame bodies, but it feels solid and comfortable in your hands with a decent sized grip that's actually tall enough to accommodate all my fingers. In terms of controls, the R8's top panel looks a lot like the R6 II, starting with a switch for stills and movies on the left side. In the middle is one of Canon's now standard multifunction accessory shoes, and to its right a recessed mode dial, along with a thumb dial sporting a power and locking collar. There's also a finger dial and dedicated record button. From the rear, the R8 is more like the budget RP, lacking the rear wheel and AF joystick of higher end models like the R6 II, although you can use the screen as a touchpad to adjust the autofocus position while you're using the viewfinder. Speaking of which, the EVF specification also matches the RP with a basic 2.36 million dot OLED panel with 0.7 times magnification. So it's fine, but not as detailed as the 3.69 million dot panel on the R6 II, and it also delivers a slightly smaller image too. The screen's the same as the R6 II though, a three inch panel with 1.62 million dots and a side hinge mechanism, which allows it to face forward for vlogging and selfies, twist up and down for framing at unusual angles, or back on itself for protection. Again, in the absence of an AF joystick, you can use the screen as a touchpad to control the autofocus position. The R8 offers the same ports as the R6 II as well, albeit presented in a different arrangement. You get micro HDMI and USB-C, the latter supporting power delivery for charging or actual powered operation, as well as data transfer. There's also three and a half mil jacks for microphones and headphones, as well as a wired remote control port. But unlike the R6 Mark II, there's no option to output raw video over HDMI. In one of the biggest physical downgrades from the R6 II, the R8 switches to a single SD card slot and the smaller LP E17 battery, both housed in the same compartment under the camera. Only you can decide if you can live without the backup a second card can provide, but everyone will feel the impact of the smaller battery, especially videographers. The R8 may allow clips lasting up to two hours each, but my fully charged battery ran out after 65 minutes of 4K 25p, so longer clips will require external USB power. I actually put this to the test and managed a full two hour clip of 4K 25p while powering the R8 with my MacBook Pro charger. Which leads me to the other major downgrade from the R6 II. The R8 does not have sensor shift stabilization or IBIS for short. In this respect, not to mention the single card slot, the R8 is actually no different from the original R and RP, but it's still the first new full frame EOS R camera not to have it. How big a deal this is will depend on which lenses you're using, as those with optical IS of their own, like the RF 24 to 50 kit zoom, will still do a fair job at ironing out most wobbles. Also, don't forget there is also optional digital stabilization for movies too, albeit incurring a crop and not available for still photography. I'm gonna show you some examples of how that works in just a moment. As an EOS R camera, the R8 has an RF lens mount, which right now means the only native lenses designed specifically for it are made by Canon. Sadly, there's still no third-party lenses in the native RF mount, but you can adapt older EF DSLR lenses from both Canon and other brands. That said, I really hope Sigma and Tamron are able to make native RF versions sooner rather than later, as it would really make Canon's system much more attractive, not to mention competitive against rivals that already support third-party lenses. So let's move on to photo quality, with the R8 employing the same 24 megapixel full-frame sensor as the R6 II, capturing images with up to 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. You can record RAW in standard or compressed formats, both at the full 24 megapixels, but the compressed version occupying roughly two thirds of the file size, while still giving you the flexibility of post-processing. Meanwhile, JPEG shooters have the choice of four resolutions, 24, 11, 5.9 or 3.8 megapixels, with all but the smallest available with two different compression levels. You can also switch the camera to record 10-bit HIF rather than JPEG if preferred. Under the aspect ratio menu, you can choose 3x2 in full frame or cropped formats, the latter applying the same 1.6x field reduction as Canon's APS-C models, or the full frame cropped to 1 to 1, 4x3, or 16x9. Here's a couple of photos I took with the R8, although since it shares essentially the same photo quality as the R6 II, I'll encourage you to watch my in-depth video about that model if you'd like a deep dive into the resolution, the noise levels, and the raw dynamic range. 
suffice it to say here, the R8 delivered equally satisfying images out of camera as its pricier sibling. I'm also relieved to see Canon equipping the R8 with what looks like the same autofocus system and options of the R6 II, which in my test of that model, proved to be one of the most confident all-rounders that I've used to date. So along with a selection of AF areas, including customizable zones, the R8 inherits the same subject detection capabilities with separate modes for people, animals, which includes birds, and vehicles, or an auto option, which attempts to figure everything out by itself. I'm going to show you a clip from my R6 II review as when I tested the R8, it performed identically in this regard. You'll see it here set to the auto subject mode, effortlessly recognizing humans, even the back of their heads or torsos, as well as passing vehicles. Like the R6 II, I found that auto mode was perfect for general use and a highlight of the camera. Although if you're only going to be shooting one specific subject, like cars at a race or people at an event or maybe animals in a zoo, you'll enjoy a boost in recognition speed and accuracy by selecting that specific type in the subject menu. As a quick starter, here's the EOS R8 fitted with the RF 15 to 30 at 30mm f6.3, focus pulling between the two bottles here in a single AF mode. It's pretty quick and confident as you'd expect. Or if you prefer to an adapt an EF lens, here's the older EF 50mm f1.8, wide open at f1.8, again focusing accurately between the two bottles. The racking speed here is limited by the focusing motors on this particular lens. Moving on to burst, the pricier R6 II boasted one of the fastest mechanical shutters of its peer group at 12 frames per second. The R8 though is notably slower, only shooting up to six frames per second with its mechanical shutter, which is also only available in an electronic first curtain mode. Here's how that sounds. And here's my splash test which also confirmed the six frames per second speed. And if you've seen any of my other reviews, you'll notice the relatively modest number of frames to choose from here. In my formal test, the R8 seemed happy to keep recording JPEGs at six frames per second for as long as I held the shutter down with the modest speed eliminating any bottlenecks with the SD card. If you set to raw though, you're limited to around 35 frames at the top speed. If you're after a faster burst though, the R8's fully electronic and silent shutter will match the top speed of the R6 to a 40 frames per second. And here's how that looks with my splash test, showing considerably more frames to choose from. You may however have noticed some skewing on the falling brick, as like the R6 II and most cameras without stacked sensors, the electronic mode will suffer from rolling shutter artifacts if the subject or the camera are in motion but it is there if you need that extra speed or silent operation. In my formal test, I confirmed the speed of 40 frames per second, recording 99 JPEGs in two and a half seconds, after which it took about 14 seconds to fully empty the buffer to the SD card. Once again, if you're shooting RAW, you're gonna be limited to around 35 frames. The R8 also inherits the RAW burst mode of the R6 II, which grabs a short burst of frames at 30 frames per second using the electronic shutter, with a cunning pre-burst option that keeps a rolling buffer of the last 16 shots as the shutter is half pressed. These are then committed to memory when you fully push down the shutter, allowing you to record the moments just before. So here's my splash test once again in playback where you can navigate the raw burst. Frame 16 represents the moment that I fully pushed down on the shutter. And as you can see, I've actually missed the initial contact. You can of course go forward in the sequence like any other burst, but also backwards to those frames prior to the full push. In this case, capturing the moment that the block is in the air or hits the water. It's easy to see how this could be used for birds taking flight, although do remember the skewing caveats of using the electronic shutter. Just before moving on, the R8 also inherits many of the R62's other photo features, including focus bracketing and stacking in camera, multiple exposures and a bulb timer. None of these are casualties of the price cut. Next for video with the R8 inheriting most of the capabilities of the higher end R6 II, including uncropped and oversampled 4K video from 24 to 60p. 1080 is also available in a high speed mode up to 180p, albeit with no sound. All video is encoded using IPB compression with standard or light options. You also get the full autofocus options, subject detection, and the chance to record C-Log3 for grading, as well as using false colors to judge exposure. The maximum clip length is two hours for any 1080 or 4K mode up to 60p, although as I mentioned earlier, a fully charged battery only got me just over an hour's worth of 4K. 
switch to slow motion 1080 and the maximum clip length becomes 30 minutes at 100 or 120p or 20 minutes at 150 or 180p. As noted earlier, the RA also misses out on 6K raw video over HDMI that you get on the R6 II. Let's have a look at some footage filmed with the R8, starting with 1080 at 25p, followed by 1080 at 50p, both uncropped as you'd hope, and here using the RF 15 to 30 at 30mm. Now here's 4K at 25p, showing a boost in detail thanks to the oversampling, followed by 4K at 50p, impressively still using the full image width without a crop. Indeed, this makes the R8 one of the cheapest full framers with uncropped, oversampled 4K up to 60p. Oh, and here's the same view filmed in 4K 25p, but using C-Log3 for grading later. The base sensitivity here becomes 800 ISO. Now back to 1080 at 25p before switching to the high frame rate modes, first at 100p or 120p if the video system is set to NTSC, followed by 150p or 180p for NTSC. Like most Canon cameras, there's no sound recorded above 60p and the footage is automatically slowed down, in this case by four or six times on my 25p timeline. To demonstrate the slow motion in action, here's that splash test in 4K 50 playing back at normal speed. And now here's the same clip, but playing back at 25p for half speed. Next, here's 1080 at 100p for a four times slowdown, obviously with a reduction in quality. And finally, for 1080 at 150p for a six times slowdown on my 25p timeline. To test movie autofocus, here's a quick focus pulling test with the R8, an RF 15 to 30 at 30mm 6.3. This lens doesn't have the fastest focus motors and the depth of field is not exactly challenging here, but you can still see it's smooth and confident. For comparison, here's an adapted EF 50mm 1.8 STM, again a fairly leisurely focuser, but again driven by the R8 confidently here with a much shallower depth of field at f1.8. Side note, I've boosted the tracking sensitivity here in the menus a little to speed up the initial response. Again, the actual racking speed is limited by the lens here. Single AF pulls are easy though, so let's try face and eye tracking with the R8 and adapted 50mm at f1.8 again. Here I'm using people as the subject and the R8 is easily driving the lens to follow me as I move around or back and forth. Notice how when I duck out of the frame that the R8 refocuses on the background like you see on most other cameras. But now let's try the R8 with subject detection set to detect only in the menus, an option inherited from the R6 II. Notice how when I'm in the frame, the camera continues to adjust its focus as normal, but when I duck out, it stays locked onto the last position. This is because the mode is now only telling it to refocus when the selected subject, in this case, a person is on the frame. If there's no people on the frame, there's no change in focus. So when I re-enter the shot, it refocuses on me and then it locks again when I exit. The result is more like what you'd see with a professional focus puller in TV or movies, where they'd rarely if ever refocus on the background after a person left the frame. It's quite a nice new feature. And finally, before my verdict, a few quick vlogging tests filmed here with the R8 and the RF 15 to 30, initially set to 24 mil to represent the widest coverage that you get with the 24 to 50 kit zoom. My first clip is without any stabilization at all. Remember the R8 lacks IBIS, so relies on optical IS in the lens and or digital in the body. So here's the same walk, but with the lenses optical stabilization enabled. It's not perfect, but it is an improvement over the unstabilized version before. Next, here's a version with both optical IS in the lens and digital movie stabilization set to standard, where the view is much steadier than before, but at the cost of a crop. And since I started at 24 mil, it's now become arguably too tight for handheld vlogging. The enhanced digital mode crops even more, so I'll mercifully move on to my last clip, still used in enhanced mode, but this time with the lens zoomed out to 15 mil. The digital stabilization set to enhance still crops the image a great deal, but since I've started at 15 mil, the end result is much more acceptable. So if you're buying the R8 with the 24 to 50 kit zoom for vlogging, beware that it may not be wide enough for filming at arm's length when you're also applying digital stabilization. If you're gonna be doing handheld vlogging, I'd recommend using the RF 15 to 30 or perhaps the RF 16. And now for my final verdict. The Canon EOS R8 essentially takes the sensor of the higher end R6 II and packs it into a simpler, lighter body, more akin to the entry level RP. As such, it's perfectly positioned between those two models, delivering the photo, video, and autofocus of the higher end R6 II at a much more affordable price. 
and in a smaller body. To meet its lower price point, the R8 loses the IBIS and 6K RAW video of the R6 II. It has a single card slot, a low resolution viewfinder, no joystick or rear wheel, a slower mechanical burst speed, and a smaller battery too. Of all of these losses, I'm personally saddest to see the absence of IBIS, but at roughly two thirds the price of the R6 II, these are sacrifices that you may be willing or indeed even happy to make. In fact, in Canon's range, I'd say the R8 hits the sweet spot between features and price and makes a pretty compelling upgrade for owners of the R and RP, not to mention those moving up from, say, an earlier DSLR or an APS-C model. If you're not wedded to the Canon system, though, there are decent alternatives. If you're looking for a full-frame camera with the benefit of IBIS, Sony's a7 III and the original Panasonic Lumix S5 are roughly the same price, and it's not a huge jump to the two grand price point of models like the Lumix S5 II or indeed the original EOS R6. As always, you'll need to carefully weigh up which feature set best matches your personal requirements, but for the money, I reckon Canon's put together a pretty solid specification for the EOS R8, which turned out to be a very satisfying all-round camera. And that's it for this review. As always, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments. And if you found any of it useful, please do consider giving this video a like and my channel a follow. And thanks again to MPB for sponsoring this video. If you have any photo gear to buy, sell or trade, check them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.